name is Sarah and I'm the owner of Sava Wellness. Today we're doing another part of the series of my interview series for the Sava community and today I'm talking with Beth. Hi Beth, it's great to talk with you today. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Hi Sarah, I'm Beth and I'm a chronically ill artist based in the UK. <laughs> um, I just uh, do my thing and hope people like it really. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I know we're definitely going to talk about your art later because what you do is very important and very cool. So uh, everyone stay tuned because it's amazing. Um, I do ask everyone this question as we're getting to know each other because um, it's very interesting to hear who can and who can't. So uh, if do you have a job outside of your chronic illness um, and do you want to share about it? And I do realize for everyone out there, and including Beth and me, you've already talked about it, that chronic illness is a full-time job. So if you don't have one, don't worry, because chronic illness can take up all of your time. And that's completely understandable if it does, because the day-to-day -day maintenance of having a chronic illness is intense <laughs> from time to time. So it's I totally get if it's too much. Um, I do have a job. I work in a really... Uh, small cafe serving coffee and cake it's very chill um, I work part-time due to my chronic illness so I do work but only less nowadays and I run my uh, small business art adventure in the meantime when I'm not at work. Great thank you um, so we're going to jump right into talking about your chronic illness so do you have a diagnosis for your symptoms? Yes it took a long time to get there as most diagnoses sometimes do, but I do have a diagnosis. Okay. Um, can you tell us what that diagnosis is and describe what that means for you? So I have an illness called inflammatory bowel disease, which is also known as IBD. And uh, there's two forms of IBD. There's the more commonly known one called Crohn's disease. And then there's mine <laughs> that is called ulcerative colitis. And um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease both pretty much do the same thing in different ways. It's a autoimmune disease that attacks your intestines and gastro system. So my immune system thinks that my gastro system should be there and likes to attack it and try and get rid of it. But that's not very practical. So it causes a lot of issues. <laughs> um, day to day, I used to suffer, and I say this greatly, I used to suffer really badly with my illness um, to the point where I barely worked and I was, uh, very thin and very fatigued and, and struggled really badly and um, that all changed about two years ago when I had my permanent ileostomy surgery to have an ostomy. I understand an ostomy isn't for everyone and it's not a cure for everyone's IVD either but for me it, I'm blessed enough that it's put me in remission to a certain extent. <laughs> so um, I still suffer with my illness and uh, having an ostomy is not a cure and um, it is just a treatment plan quite an excessive treatment plan because you're removing some of your gastro tract <laughs> to survive basically but um it is only a treatment plan so I still have fatigue I still have brain fog still have nausea still have joint pain still have some bleeding from orifices <laughs> um it is a thing <laughs> but yeah I am a lot better for it now maybe. <laughs> I know some people may not know what an ostomy is. Could you please, if you're comfortable, could you please describe yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, an ostomy is a medical device you wear on your stomach. So an ileostomy surgery is where they remove, in my case, my entire larger intestine or the colon. And now a small piece of my small intestine pokes out of my stomach near my belly button. And it is surgically sewn on that way. So now I would pass feces and output through that exit made in my stomach so an ostomy bag is a medical device that you place over that new exit that collects the output as it is goes out the body basically okay and that sounds like a well it is a major surgery yeah. did that take quite a long recovery time for you um i had seven days in hospital in intensive care and then when i came out of hospital i had probably about two months off work just I probably could have done it quite quicker I probably could have done it within a month but um it was a big adaptation to how you live your life so I took that extra month to kind of work out what I was doing <laughs> before I'm confident enough to then go back into a workplace setting 
but um you know that's a different side. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um did um finally getting a diagnosis help you? Oh, this is a hard one for people because when I got told my diagnosis, I was like, this is it. This is what was wrong with me. I finally got an answer. But in the same breath, God, going into treatment and then really processing the fact that I now have a lifelong autoimmune disease was harder the longer it went on. The initial, like, you have a diagnosis, is fantastic. And I know it took me three years to get that diagnosis. So it, I was misdiagnosed for a long time. So it was really bad. <laughs> and then someone figured it out. Um, so I appreciate that getting diagnosis isn't for everyone and it is really serious to get them diagnoses. Um, but in the same way, having it mentally, ooh, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to process sometimes the gravity of the words that the doctors say to you. Like, if I just say, I've got IBD, I'm like, cool, what's that? <laughs> and then you learn about it and you go, oh, this is scary. <laughs> so there's lots of layers to it. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. It's it's all of a sudden like when they speak those words, your life has changed, right? Yeah, instantly in that moment. Yeah, yeah, I can see then how having a diagnosis for a moment is like a clear yay, and then you're like, wait, <laughs> yeah, one minute, let's backtrack. What happened? <laughs> yeah. yeah, hugely. Yeah, totally. Um, and I know you just briefly said this. But um, a lot of people in the chronic illness community, it takes quite a while to find a diagnosis. So what was your journey to finding a diagnosis for you? Well, like I said, it took me three years and it probably took longer than three years. It was three years of me actively being at my doctors and demanding answers. <laughs> I had symptoms before that, but because without being graphic, because it's to do with your gastro tract and feces and stuff it's not something you always want to go into the doctors and talk about it's embarrassing even though everyone does it we don't want to talk about it and so I put it off for a while being like oh, I'm sure I just I'm sure it's fine I'm sure it's stress or whatever dietary or whatever until I started chasing it three years ago and demanding doctors to listen to me um to the point where I have to I don't know how it works in Canada but in the UK you go to your um, general doctor or your GP or general practitioner and then they kind of give you a base diagnosis and I kept getting stuck in this loop of them just going it could be this it could be that but we don't know and then it took for me to advocate for myself and go I want to see a gastro I want to see someone at the hospital I want to see someone who knows who's a specialist in this please and then when I met my doctor Nick White he was fantastic absolutely my life it still took a good six months from meeting him to get in my diagnosis but the it fast tracked the whole process for me massively having someone who actually knew what I was trying to explain to him and understand uh, the ins and outs of the gastro system and just he's so clever <laughs> so clever that's good was it was it a relief when you were finally able to see someone who could help you absolutely absolutely like I call him scary clever because like you go into with these doctor's appointments and you're expecting to stand up for yourself again and defend what's happening and please believe me this is happening to me and um, he was like yep I've got you let's do this test let's do that test we're done if it's not this it'll be that and if it's not that it's this I had answers from day one of all the options it could be um including even though I know it's super scary he told me from day one it could be bowel cancer you know and I was only 24 at the time. So I was like, okay. <laughs> but he was like, it could not be. It could be ulcerative colitis. It could be, you know, Crohn's disease. It could be parasites or it could be cancer. <laughs> you know, he was very, from day one, this is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. This is what it could be. And then when I went, we know what it is. It's IBD, it's ulcerative colitis. So like after we ran all the tests. So it was, it changed my life meeting that man massively. Mm -hmm. And how, how did you get the courage to start to advocate for yourself? Frustration. In all honesty, I got to a point where I knew something was wrong 
and nobody was listening. And I think we all as chronic illness warriors get to a point that we have to, it makes you strong. It makes you stand up for yourself. Um, you learn that nobody else is going to save you. And the only person who's going to fix these issues is if you find the right people to listen, unfortunately. And that could be really hard, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really hard. Yeah, I'm glad you did it though, because look at all the results you got in six months after. Honestly, fantastic, honestly, they were brilliant. I mean, it was quite evasive. I had lots of scopes, <laughs> lots of pieces, <laughs> but we got there in the end. And then, you know, we moved on to the treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think some people might just think it's just like a little bit of blood tests and that's how you get, but like you're, you're, so, you're, invas you're invaded yeah. for all these tests, weren't you? Yeah, yeah massively. Scope after scope, blood tests, uh, MRI scans. You have to drink certain paste to have certain scans. It's just revolting. The whole process is revolting. Yeah. And then, like I said, like, you, that just gets you to your diagnosis. It gets you to that epiphany moment. And then you have to then live with the illness. It's like, it doesn't stop once you've got that, unfortunately. No, and it goes back to, like, you almost have that relief, right? Like, oh, I finally get that diagnosis. And then you're like, oh, but that doesn't mean that all this... I've had to go through is now done it's like no now over. I have different steps to go through all this yeah really I, I call it resilient I yeah. think it makes you resilient to being poked and prodded <laughs> to a certain extent um it really toughens you up a little bit chronic illness yeah yeah well thank you for sharing that um we'll continue on with a little bit more questions about that um, when did you first realize that you had chronic illness? And we've already talked a, lo a little bit about how your journey has since been since then. But um, yeah, uh, when did you first notice? Um, I don't know where to place that to be because I acknowledged being chronically ill from the moment I got diagnosed and like that whole like go like it not being over and I've got to keep going. Um, but you could also say I knew something was wrong, even if I don't know it was, I didn't know it was chronic illness, but I knew something was wrong for a, for a good probably three years prior to my three years chasing doctors. So a good six years of my life, I was, I knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. So, and it wasn't until I got that diagnosis that I associated it with that term of chronic illness. Mm -hmm. And then the term disability is a whole different <laughs> cat of fish after that um it, how it just certain words change your mindset on it mm. yeah. because knowing something wrong is different than being chronically ill and then being chronically ill is different to being <laughs> disabled like it's like levels <laughs> as you work through it all yeah yeah it's you're always working through things with chronic illness yeah. I guess Silent battles. That's how my doctor describes it. Yeah, and like you said, resilience, right? Like, yeah, you have to get. To, you have. You have. Not every. That sounds awful. Not everyone can, but we all try to be. We all it makes you whether you want to or not become that resilient. It makes you a bit tougher and a bit harder and a bit um compass mentors of what's happening to you. Like you kind of dissociate from it sometimes. Mm -hmm. to protect yourself from what's happening yeah yeah that's a that's a very good point yeah um how has your experiences of the world changed since your symptoms started I see the world differently now in many ways there's two levels to this there's like the practicality of environment I am so much more aware of things aren't accessible now mm -hmm. I, I never even thought about it before if who used the disabled toilet or how would you use one or why are they so big now I know why they're so big <laughs> because not only if people have wheelchairs but like I have to like straddle a toilet to be able to empty my bag like you try and get in a cubicle and do that is hard work <laughs> I now appreciate and see things differently like physical stuff if there's a car parked on the pavement I'm like oh my god I'm gonna have to walk on the road what if I was in a wheelchair how would I even navigate this situation like it's changed how I see 
my place in the world and the chronically ill community in the world massively. Um, personally, I find that people ask me questions now. I don't know if you agree. I have people kind of come to me like, so my uh, gastro output was like this today. Is that normal? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I know why you're asking me, but you should just learn. <laughs> like people ask me the oddest things now, which is, it makes me laugh. I'm all for it. I'm an open book. Ask me anything when it comes to two. Okay. <laughs> like, ask me anything. But that didn't happen before because I, everyone just didn't talk about it. But then I'm the chronically ill one now. So they asked me, which is interesting how that happens to you. Yeah. Yeah. I never really thought about it that way, but you're right. And you almost sometimes want to be like, can you just read this pamphlet? Yeah. Can you not? Because it has to be me <laughs> to ask this. But I'm the gastro girl, I suppose. <laughs> In my workplace, at least, I'm the person they ask. <laughs> so odd. I'm glad you have a good humor about it because, yeah, uh, that's very. <laughs> maybe it's the British in me, maybe it's the English thing. Like, we just talk about anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> um, so, what on your daily basis do you find the most debilitating about your symptoms and why? fatigue is awful <laughs> and until you know what real fatigue is <laughs> don't think people really grasp I think they think fatigue is just being tired mm -hmm. but being fatigued is so much more <laughs> than being tired um that's a hard one to kind of explain to people what you're struggling with in that day um and as for me managing my ostomy can be very intensive some days um, I can manage it very well I'm very happy with it I'm glad I made the decisions I made but um, like I'll, I'll manage it I need to watch what I eat I know what my output is I know how full my bag is I know if I go for a wee I might not my bag I know okay I'll wear leggings today so I have access to my bag if I wear dungarees today it's gonna be a nightmare when I sit in the toilet and try and get my bag out if I go to a nice meal and I get dressed up I am very aware of it it becomes a part of how I think about myself but to other people they'll go what's wrong with you and they'll go well my bag's just doing my head in today it's just poking me in the side of my rib and nobody you don't care you don't need to know about it but <laughs> that's what I'm managing today like I don't think people really grasp how much we normalize our symptoms until you have to explain it to someone else <laughs> does that make sense yeah yeah because it just it becomes natural right so it does 100 yeah. percent. if I know my stoma is poking me or I've had something that's just not working right today I can pretend like it's fine because it's normal to me mm -hmm. and then other people go well why are you rubbing your stomach all the time or why are you you know drinking 10 times more than you normally do and I'll go oh I'm just dealing with this you don't need to worry about it I'm just dealing with this but they don't see that until you point it out. Yeah, and then sometimes when you point out exactly what's going on and you list it all out, everyone's like, "Are you okay? <laughs> you need to go home." <laughs> like I deal with this every day, right? Oh, yeah, don't worry about it. It's only abdominal pain. It's normal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, that not me too much sensible, but I'm currently in a weird flare at the moment and mm. um, for example without get, there's no non gritty way to get into it <laughs> Fine, go for it. yeah so with my ostomy I still have my rectum even though I don't use it um and so with my illness it still likes to attack that last little bit I've got left <laughs> and so I'm on medication at the moment for that issue to reduce symptoms and I'll have people be like, well, why are you on medication now? I thought you were in remission. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just my bleeding rectum. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. And I go, what? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's just so funny how we manage it. For example, I don't, I don't take medication. So now I take medication. And they're all like, why are you suddenly taking medication? And then you list why, and they go a bit. 
do you still have issues? I'm like, yes, I still have issues. So I did get sick. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't work that way. Do you have um, a lot of people that think because you have the ostomy bag, you're cured now? Yes. Yeah, 100%. 100% go, well, you're not on medication anymore. You've put weight on again. You know, you're thriving in, compared to how you used to be, or you couldn't leave the house. I can leave the house again. Mm. But doesn't mean I still suffer with different things and managing an ostomy in general but um it's very much a lot of a lot of people think it's a cure and it's not it's just a very extreme treatment it really is um and it took me to get to a very extreme place to choose that treatment mm -hmm. um I don't know how it works in every other country but um it there's like levels in England of treatment so you can have like initial tablets and then you can go to injections and then you go to you know IV treatment and then it kind of escalates from there and um, my doctor was very much like we will give you every drug in the sun when you're born with your colon I'll get rid of it <laughs> like you tell me when you're done <laughs> with your organs <laughs> like and I'll sort it out but not everyone can accept an ostomy when it comes to the IBD community and then there is this huge thing around the fact that if you have one, it cures you. Or if you have one, it's a a failure to the illness in the nicest possible way. That you didn't keep your organ. You didn't, you know, like maybe not not everywhere, but definitely in England, I've had people go who have the same illness. And they're going, oh, I could never. Like, and you're like, wait, we're in this together, you know. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't lose my organ because I wanted to lose it. I lose it because I have to lose it. Yeah. So it's very much uh, in the nice possible way seen as a you lost the battle. That's why you've got one. Oh. Instead of seeing it as a, just another treatment and yeah. that you're alive because of it. Because yeah. if I kept my colon I would still be in hospital. Yeah. Yeah. And it you just sorry I'm trying to think of words that, oh, okay. um because that's just so awful because it's it's you've chosen what is best for your body you've chosen what is best for yourself right and no one should judge you for that I know that is so easy to say and I know that you deal with that every day but it's yeah it's like you're in so much pain of course you want to get rid of the pain if that was the viable treatment for you why why wouldn't you do it and I think it brings up a very valid point that even though, say, you and I had the exact same illness, it doesn't mean we have the exact same experiences. Like those people coming up to you and saying, oh, I would never. And I was like, well, do you have as much bleeding as I did? Do you have as, yeah. bleeding, as much pain? You're not there yet, maybe. Like, yeah. Don't worry about it. That's a good thing. You don't want to be where I was. Yeah. You know, but I survived it. And I am very much empowered by my destiny because of that. Yeah. Yeah. A huge part and I think people miss that and that's what's so important and that was such an empowering brave decision that you did to take your treatment like that because there's no there's no turning back on that and look at how much better you're doing now right you're not in the yeah. hospital anymore and I think people just need to know that that you do what is best for you and that is empowering right <laughs> absolutely I couldn't agree more it's perfect way to say it because the stigma shouldn't exist anymore like I got why it did I get it's not a fun topic <laughs> you know but medical devices in general whether it's a catheter or a urostomy or anything like that keeps that person alive why would you ever diminish that like or say it's not good enough mm -hmm. because it's not attractive enough or beautiful enough like well I didn't want I'll watch my words I didn't want a poo bag attached to my stomach but I have one and I'm better off for it mm -hmm. yeah it's I, a part I, of me yeah it's part of you and it's what allows you to go back to your job and to to have live. a life again yeah. literally have a life again yeah and I, I think that there's another difference between the chronic illness community and the rest of the world is that they don't realize how normal it is to talk about bodies in our community right like 
I'm, I'm not even blinking when you're talking about I, I have poo in my bag. Right, great. Right. Like, yeah, wow. Great right where the it. people are like, you talk about that? And you're like, yeah. yeah, it's just who I am. It's it's part of my experience. Like, yeah, I wish the stigma of talking about bodies would be lessened because it does diminish our experiences if we can't talk about the ostomy bag, right? I don't know if you agree or not, but do you find... Um with people in the chronic illness, chronic illness community that we are more aware of how bodies work and there's a lot of people that go well, I don't know where my pancreas is I'm like well how do you know it needs removing then <laughs> like like if you don't understand why my colon was failing to why it needed removing then how can you judge and like you can't even join this conversation mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you need to learn autonomy <laughs> you need to learn some basic understanding of why things work for you and why things didn't for me Mm -hmm. you know it's just like fundamental knowledge of lack of knowledge does that make sense yeah totally it's like you just need to pick up one of those picture books and yeah just have a flip through understand how it all works yeah yeah sorry go ahead yeah it's not sorry it's not wrong to talk about poo it's not wrong to talk about output or bleeding or you know whatever your your gig is as we call it like you know it's very normal to talk about bodies and what how it functions and why it's doing what it's doing Mm -hmm. but people are shocked because you want to you even know about it never mind talk about it like how do you know about that I'm like well I have to live with it I need to know why mine doesn't work for my own sanity yes yeah I I, I totally agree then yeah or like they get um some a little bit squeamish about trying to go get one vial of blood and you're like in Canada girl needles <laughs> over it <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I get I get needles are scary but mm, catch up <laughs> yeah totally yeah I think that would come be- back to me when you've been stabbed 50 times and they yeah, yeah. yeah like come back <laughs> yeah I think if there is something that everyone could do that's not in the chronic illness community it would just be to learn basic anatomy so that when we talk about it it would be so helpful it's and not a shock fun. it shouldn't be a shock <laughs> yeah you know, yeah you can feel however you feel about someone being chronically ill but the fact you don't even understand what they're talking about <laughs> is difficult to get through to them sometimes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I think and this is with lots of things that you're bringing awareness to, like not just chronic illness, but the people who are chronically ill don't always have the energy to be the educator, right? Like sometimes it would be nice if your friend said, oh, you have IBD. Okay. And then two days later say, so I read a book on <laughs> or whatever, right? Just so that you I, don't have oh, to describe it. So, so laugh at this. I already met one person like that. I've got lots of friends, you know, as you do, work colleagues. I met one cleaning lady in my building and I was having a bad ostomy day and I was literally on the floor having a blockage at work. <laughs> like it makes me literally fall out like on the knees in pain, like it's not a good thing. And she's she came in to me being looked after by other staff members and was like, She's brand new, she knew nothing about it. She went, Are you okay? And I said, Oh, I've, I'm just having an ostomy blockage and Tyler's just staying with me. It's all good for me, don't worry about it. And then she came back the next day and said, I Googled what an ostomy was because I, did, I felt bad. I didn't understand what was happening. She was the only person I've ever met. And now she's one of my best friends because just the interest, she felt bad not understanding what was happening. Mm-hmm. Nobody else cared. <laughs> like a lot of people are like, okay, cool. As long as you're going to be okay after this, like, you know, that's all they care about. And that's lovely. But she took the extra step to go and find out why and what was happening because mm. she felt she didn't want to ask me <laughs> and then she felt bad as not understanding but yeah it's that, it's, that little, <laughs> it's that little bit of act of kindness that shows so much care and can mean so much yeah. it meant so much so much of the time she still comes back and goes I've got questions I'm like you ask questions honey (laughs) you ask all the questions yeah well that's so nice now we've talked about um 
like debilitating symptoms and um well, actually I don't know if I asked you this question already um go on. can you describe what a bad symptom wise day looks for you well as I, I kind of just skimmed across a blockage is my bad moment I can have it can take over my whole day <laughs> so because I don't have much intestine left <laughs> um depending what I eat if it's too fibrous or I've not drank enough with it or I've not chewed it well enough, it can cause blockages in my track. Um, I don't know 100% why it happens. I just know it does happen. Um, and it is basically something to do with like just the gastro system struggling to process. So normally things that didn't get processed would have just be absorbed through the colon and solidified later down the line. But the line can't do that anymore because I don't have that part. So it can get stuck in, like near the exit or anything like that. Um if you've got a narrowing of your intestine it's crazy. Um and my body goes into shock basically. So I will have pain, I will practically lay on the floor <laughs> for a bit. Um I it, I can't this is it's the oddest feeling to describe because it makes you feel like you're going to throw up, but you can't throw up because it's too far down the gastro tract. <laughs> so then your body's natural instinct is to pass the blockage or have a spout of diarrhea or something to move it. But I don't have that exit anymore. <laughs> so, and I can't, without being graphic, push anything through like that. So it, it, it sends you, like, the nerves to my colon are still there, even though my colon isn't. So it makes me feel like I'm both one going to throw up or defecate. And I can't do either, <laughs> but lay there and wait for things to kind of move. And it can last anywhere between an hour to four hours. If I'm lucky, half an hour. If I'm really lucky and it was a tiny thing and it just kind of had a moment. <laughs> but it is awful. Yeah. Yeah, I have no words <laughs> for that. That sounds terrible. There is no words. But it just, it's, once I've got over that initial shock, my, I'm just exhausted because my body's had so much energy to try and fix what was going wrong. So I'm just exhausted and I have abdominal pain and I just need to lay down for a good, <laughs> not eat anything for a good like eight hours. Um, so I could be going through my normal day and then something like that could happen where I've just not drank enough with my breakfast or I've not, I've ate my dinner too fast and not chewed it enough. And then my whole day is gone <laughs> because I've had a blockage. Yeah. It's just, it's gone. <laughs> oh, that, that must be hard to deal with. <laughs> it's not easy. I'm not going to lie. It's not easy. But I am, um, my uh, stone anniversary is in two, my two year stone anniversary is in two days. <laughs> so I'm two years in and I don't get them as much anymore. If it, it does happen, it's rubbish. <laughs> but um, I can manage it better nowadays. I know the silly tricks to have, like hot water bowls, loosening your guts up, warm it all up. Uh, fizzy pop, the bubbles, like push all the stuff through. So drink all the fizzy pop in the world. Like there is ways of making that process faster nowadays, where I didn't know originally. Yeah. So makes it a little easier <laughs> that's good yeah having little tics, tricks and tips like that it can just and it can take a while to find them but I'm glad that you have found some so that's good yeah but like I said I am even that which sounds awful is better off than where I was <laughs> where I was I couldn't even have a life now I can have a life I just every now and then break down <laughs> I have to pull myself back together um I glitch out as my partner calls it <laughs> like I just just can't function <laughs> um for a day or so and then I crack on <laughs> and then on the on the flip side when you have a good symptom day what do you like to do um I me and my partner go walking a lot we're, we're like hiking in the wilderness kind of people um which is great and there's always some woodland trail in England to go wander down and explore so that's usually what we do on that day though, if we get, yeah, everything's going good today. <laughs> yeah, we go hiking and I draw a lot. So. 
yes, don't worry, folks, we're still getting back to that. So, <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> um, what has been the most helpful for you as you've gone through this journey? Ooh. I did initially when I got first diagnosed reach out to a lot of online communities um just because I needed to know I wasn't alone <laughs> in it um now they come with their own I don't know if you agree barrel of fun because <laughs> some people are brilliant and some people just scare the jeebies out you know <laughs> and feel like it, you don't know what you ha what's going on basically um but I met a few really solid people through that especially um recently with my art side and stuff uh, I it's found the right people and the right people have messaged me and been like this is amazing to which then have led to even more brilliant online communities and friends that I message nearly daily about injections or doctor's appointments or and just because you can tell that to your friends and your family as much as possible but sometimes you just need someone who like yourself gets it <laughs> and you can kind of just go oh my just need eats all over me today that's great how's your day going <laughs> like, like kind of thing so it's it, the thing that's got me through it is the community really the, the actual people who have the same stuff and are the same age as you or the people who are five to ten years down the line and you go well it might be rubbish now but it'll get better <laughs> it's that it's I, there's it's so much more powerful than I think people realize yeah yeah and so support people and people who know what you're going through is so helpful and I found that's what I really needed as well and that's why I started Savile Wellness so that if people don't have it that they can because you're right it's it's so freeing to just be able to talk to someone who knows <laughs> like maybe not exactly true but enough that you're just like yeah you don't have to tell your family over and over again right like yeah they're just like we know we know <laughs> like, I'm having a bad day <laughs> whereas if you mess any chronic illness person who has the same illness as you and go I'm having a bad day they go oh I got you I know <laughs> like what's it today you tell me I'll tell you mine <laughs> really yeah um, and is there anything you would like people to know about your chronic illness or chronic illness in general that we haven't touched upon? Ooh. I'm going to say no, because to me, the biggest one is that ostomies are not a cure. <laughs> it's just a treatment. And I think we covered that really well earlier, to be fair. Well, everyone, we have come down to it. And now please, Beth, tell us all about your awesome illustrations. Well... From being chronically ill, <laughs> I have always drawn in my life and I was started, not necessarily Broken and Brave, it was under another title originally, my art illustrations, um, but I was started in hospital, literally, from surgery, being like, I just need to draw, I just be to, need to be normal. And the more it continued, the more I saw myself drawing chronically ill art, I started drawing every illustration or character I drew she had an ostomy bag because there was something reinforcing I needed to see myself that even with a bag I could still be beautiful or empowered from it and I agree like I said earlier it's a huge lifesaver for me it's changed my life massively so in them early days it really solidified that belief that this was the best thing for me and then as I started sharing my art I got a lot of people reach out and say oh my god I have never seen a, an aesthetic piece of art with an ostomy bag on it because ostomy bags are not pretty <laughs> like they're okay but they're not gorgeous and and they're not particularly sexy <laughs> or feminine but they're a part of us and they're a part of our bodies and if we're normalizing all bodies matter and all shapes and sizes and all skin colors and conditions then chronic illness needs to be in that. It needs to be like normalizing medical devices on bodies and that it might not be sexy, but it could be beautiful. And you can be sexy and have one at the same time, technically, if you wanted to be. So my art really took a whole tangent of a path, uh, especially recently, just really getting into it and really fleshing out what I wanted to create as a, as a business. But the initial concept is this normalizing of, 
of women and bodies and our power our empowerment from them if that makes sense no matter what scar you've got no matter what medical device you have you know even if you've got a hidden illness and you know I was I was anorexic for years and to me I always got told oh you're skinny oh you're so skinny and I was like I don't can't eat (laughs) like I'm starving to death (laughs) like but you know it's this concept that we just don't see past the surface anymore um and everything should be celebrated everything and so my art is very much all about that I had a lady message me um one about two collections ago I did one called stardust which is the whole this concept that we are made from the same model called stars as well so we are stars in our own essence and so it's these gorgeous girls and they're all surrounded by stars and fluffy clouds and one of them had a catheter and to me it was quite normal like because I'm just adding on all all the medical devices at this point and she messaged me and she was like I've never seen a piece of artwork with a catheter in it ever she was like do you know how empowering even if it's not my favorite type piece of art, or it's not in an art gallery, or it's just on Instagram, it moves her massively because she realized that she could still be a work of art. And it was a hugely profound moment for me when I realized how important this was. Um, because we go to art galleries, we see these gorgeous paintings, but none of them have got chronic illnesses in them, really, or ostomy bags, even were invented back then. But like, what's stopping modern day artists doing it we should represent someone should represent and since doing that I have found some other incredible chronic illness artists along the way <laughs> who do the same thing as me or have inspired because of me or I've inspired I've been inspired from their art if that makes sense it's it everyone really it, it's amazing and it really is important for empowering to have these different medical devices in art and I, I I just love it and if you could please tell us how to find you that would be great so you can find me on Instagram at broken and brave or I do have a website now at broken and brave uh, and you can go and find all of my blog and everything I'm currently working on over there and all projects wonderful Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Beth. It's been so wonderful to get to know you more. (laughs) Absolutely. No worries. (laughs) 